Hello, everyone, and welcome to Wine Grants, unscripted chat about the unfunded, the official podcast of the unfunded list. I'm Dave Moss, the founder of the unfunded list uh, and board member of the Moss Family Foundation. With me this week is Alexander Berger. Say hello, Alexander. Hey there. How's it going? Hey, uh, it's going pretty good. I'm in a booth with you drinking some Pinot Noir. It's delicious. It is very good. Uh, I want to thank you for recommending and I don't believe anybody's recommended Pinot Noir, and it's one of my... Uh, one of my favorites. Uh, we had um, we drank cognac uh, a couple weeks ago, which uh, is technically a wine. I was going to say barely. Yeah, it's technically. I mean, I didn't clarify that. Uh, and um, next time I'm asking for whiskey. Yeah, that was not. I mean, if I wanted to do whiskey grants, I would have done whiskey grants exactly. Um, but uh, so I want to thank you for picking an actual, you know, known wine, um, and um, and a delicious one at that. Uh, uh, we always like to start the episodes off by reading our guest's bio out loud, and uh, we also love setting records here in Wine Grants. So not only is this the first uh, bottle of Pinot Noir, but I think, I'm pretty sure this is going to be the shortest bio I've ever read here in the booth. So here we go. Alexander Berger is the program officer for U.S. policy at GiveWell. Alexander graduated from Stanford University in 2011 with a B.A. in philosophy and an M.A. in policy, organization, and leadership studies from the School of Education. He joined GiveWell in July 2011. Welcome to the booth, Alexander. Thanks so much for having me. Pretty much everybody knows everything they could possibly need to know about you. There's really nothing else to say. Uh, yep. Um, you graduated with a BA in philosophy. Who's your favorite philosopher? Oh, wow. That is a tough question. Um, it was Dave Moss of the Unfunded List. Exactly. His deep <laughs> insights have really moved my worldview. Um, so I think that the one, this is a little bit stereotypical for uh, people in my position, but the the philosopher who's probably most moved my thinking and like most affected my life path is a living Australian philosopher named Peter Singer, who's a professor at Princeton. Sure. Um, and, you know, Definitely don't agree with everything he says, but I think that he's if probably. You, I don't. I think anybody. Probably nobody. I don't think Peter Singer agrees with everything. <laughs> I actually think that's he right. Uh, and, and his views have interestingly evolved over the years. But uh, I find him like you know he's a very practical philosopher mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, and I, I found him pretty useful. My, my all my philosophy professors who listen to this will be disappointed that I'm not coming through with the the Rawlsian answer. But so there is no answer that would not disappoint it's your true. philosophy professors. I can assure you. Yeah, it's not them. So. <laughs> Also, they're probably not listening. The uh, it is you're right. Uh, you know, given what you do, that seems like the appropriate choice. Um, I think you know, uh, and similar. I, I you know, there's lots of stuff he says that, that I don't agree with, uh, but I like that um, uh, he says it. And you're right. I like that his opinions evolve. Uh, it's very boring to me. People whose opinions do not involve uh, do not evolve. And one of my favorite politicians was a guy named Ed Koch, mayor in New York, and he once said. If you agree with me on seven out of ten things, you should vote for me. If you agree with me on ten out of ten things, you should see a psychiatrist because you're a crazy person. <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> when was he mayor? Uh, God, well, uh, I think when I was a when I was a kid, I vaguely remember it. So in the '80s, sometime, um, and I think he's still around. I'm not really sure. Yeah, I think he is. If he's not, I apologize to the to the, the memory. Um, but uh, no, the, uh, thank you, thank you very much for stopping by the booth. Uh, tell us a little bit about. Uh, um, your organization, uh, yeah. GiveWell. Well, so GiveWell is a nonprofit that was founded in 2007 to help donors decide where to give money. We basically run a website where we recommend a handful of extraordinarily deeply vetted organizations working primarily in global health, where we've done a lot of research about the interventions that they conduct, about the way that the programs are operated, and where we think that they're really cost-effective ways for donors to spend money uh, to deliver better outcomes, often in terms of health or life save, but also in terms of sort of economic outcomes like uh, more money for really like people who are part of the sort of global poor. Um, and I joined in 2011, so a few years after it was started, and, and I was about the fifth employee when I came on. Mm-hmm. Um, and now we're about 30 something. And uh, the big change over the years, I think, has been one that, you know, our research has gotten a lot bigger audience and, and gotten a lot better as we, the team has grown. But two is that I actually work on a sort of a newer project for us called the Open Philanthropy Project, right. um, which is our partnership with this new foundation called Good Ventures, started mm-hmm. by Dustin Moskowitz and Carrie Tuna. Dustin's one of the Facebook co-founders. And so we've helped them, uh, like, give most of the money that they've given in the last few years. Um and I think the, the long-term vision is that instead of start sort of primarily giving their wealth away through a private foundation, they'll give through this sort of more open public vehicle that other people could eventually join. And so mm-hmm. I think in the medium term, in the next that couple of years, 
um, we'll probably spin that vehicle out of GiveWell. Um, and so eventually I will work for an organization called the Open Philanthropy Project instead of the Open Philanthropy Project team of GiveWell. So uh, to clarify, uh, who founded GiveWell? It was founded by Holden Karnofsky and Ellie Hassenfeld. Um, in 2007, they were both like 20-somethings who had been working at a hedge fund for a couple years. They knew each other from that. They started a club with six friends to give away a little bit of you know the money that they had made that in 2006. And they quickly realized that trying to give effectively was a full-time job, not something to do with like a it few hours is. a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they quit their job and raised some money from friends to go start a, a nonprofit that was GiveWell. Mm-hmm. Uh, great. And then, and so you work specifically uh, on uh, your, uh, uh, what does it say, program officer for U.S. policy, but you yep. work mostly on the this open philanthropy project. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, my role in US, all of the U.S. policy work that happens at GiveWell is under the, the rubric of the open philanthropy project, mm-hmm. or what we call open fill, because uh, we prefer not to use OPP um, as the acronym. Understandable. Uh, um, but the... It's been hard to explain that to the press in a serious way. Um, nobody point, quite wants that quote. Um, <laughs> yep. But the, they're probably gonna sit just write OPP anyway. Thanks. Oh, what do you like? What do you want to? Uh, what do you want to say? Open. Open fill. fill. Um, I will do my best to help the, the have that catch on. Thanks, Dave. The, I appreciate Coast it. Film three, film into the community. Uh, that's all I ask. That's all I want. <laughs> uh, my my Christmas gift. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah. So I, I work on that pretty exclusively for the last couple of years. Um, before that, I worked on. Uh, you know, reading and summarizing the literature on different interventions in global health to try and build cost effectiveness models for different charities. Very, very interesting. Uh, you're really uh, much more, uh, and for, don't don't take this the wrong way. You're much wonkier uh, philanthropist than me. Um, I've always I, I I find people who know what they're talking about and listen to them. You're one of those people who knows what they're talking about. Um, I actually think of myself <laughs> as doing something very similar to you, right? Uh, I'm not an issue or a subject matter expert mm-hmm. um, in either global health or U.S. policy by any means. You're so close. Yeah, there's so a far. bug in the booth today. <laughs> Could make the podcast. I think I might. I, I, I think I might have gotten it. I don't think you did. I don't, you I, don't think so. You're, you're well, no we'll Obama. know soon. So, sorry, soon Dave. he'll fly away. Um, but uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think that you're right. That a lot of what matters in plan to me is being able to put aside your own opinions and, and consult the, the right experts at the right time. Mm-hmm. Um, that's definitely something that we see ourselves as trying to do. No, and there were there have been a couple times where I, you know, sort of tried to pretend I was an expert, right, or tried to research mm-hmm. things myself. Uh, and, you know, the, to a certain extent, that is the right thing for the philanthropist to do. Yep. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, relying on experts uh, is not uh, a sign of weakness. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. And then sometimes also experts are wrong, right? So you don't want to fetishize it. Mm. Like, the, the technocrats yeah. aren't always right. Yeah, well, uh, you know, abs- uh, that, that, that is absolutely true. Uh, you know, oftentimes, um, uh, you know, a lot, of our, a lot of the grants we received at the unfunded list were projected by people who are experts, and these are, you know, great programs. It doesn't necessarily mean um, uh, anything about their value. In fact, that was a, one of the biggest learnings for me uh, we we are uh, you know as uh, not not uh, all that well known, but we got 15 uh, proposals uh, submitted, and I had assumed from the start of launching this project that I would get bad proposals. <laughs> right? I, that that was a given for me, and it was actually part of why I wanted to do it because mm-hmm. I, I I don't want people to waste their time pursuing bad ideas, uh, and I do think it's true in the sector that in general critical feedback. Good critical feedback is hard to come by, yeah. and I've you know there's people out there who and I've seen them uh, uh, pushing bad ideas, and part of me want I wants to think that that's just because no one ever told them, because mm-hmm. someone's doing good, they started a nonprofit, they quit their job to go start a nonprofit, right? Those sorts of stories sort of you yeah. don't want to be like oh but yeah that's your what you're doing is bad yeah uh, and you should feel bad <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, it's hard um, no and no one should feel bad doing bad philanthropy. Uh, or having a bad idea for solving the world shouldn't make you feel right. bad, but we do need to find the best ones. I think yeah. that's that that's important. We should be giving well, yeah. right? Uh, talk to me a little bit more about. Uh, so we, uh, you're the one of the first philanthropists we've had in the booth who also has a list. Yeah, right. We're just two philanthropists with lists <laughs> in a booth. Totally equal. <laughs> you and I are in the exact well, same position here, but you're wearing different. a suit. Uh, well, I so uh, another assumption I have is that the uh, publishing of the list would be. Uh, like our product, right? The big, the unfunded list. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was um, uh, inspired by a number of different programs. One of them is the Blacklist, which is a, 
um, program run by some studio, some Hollywood studios uh, for screenplays that were never made into films. They ask all the readers to vote for their favorite screenplay yeah. that never that wasn't made. Yeah. Uh, and then they publish a list of based on how many votes they got from the readers. Uh, and I think the, the, their first winner uh, was actually Charlie Wilson's War, huh. uh, which got, got, made. got yeah. made into I an award-winning that. film. Uh, and in fact, pretty much every year, the, the, the winner of that list gets made, right? Because you know, there, should be a, 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 there should be a secondary market right. for these sorts of things. Right. Right? This isn't applying to college. Uh, there isn't, and there isn't, a, 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 there isn't even a common application. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, you know the idea that we're going to, and I, you know, I, I've written grants and I've spoken to people and I've looked, I've read some articles about it. It takes about four to six weeks to write mm-hmm. a solid grant proposal. When that gets rejected for no feedback, right, and then read by, and then kept secretly in yeah. a drawer, that's just such a, uh, it, it's such an inefficiency. Yeah. I think by you know just bringing them out of the drawer, putting them out. Yeah. And I actually thought that you know I would, I, you know, I, we announced the first list on Giving Tuesday, and I know that we did spur some new donations. Uh, for some of the organizations I've heard back, uh, and I uh, hopefully uh, we'll find out about some more, um, in, in, including some some fairly large donations. Awesome. Um, but uh, I actually I, I, I 100% believe that the feedback we gave, not just to the people who made the list, but uh, to the 11 folks who don't, uh, I'm still in touch with people who did not make the list, mm-hmm. facilitating some introductions, uh, uh, trying to uh, get the, get them on the phone with their evaluators so they can ask additional questions, giving them really solid feedback on their proposals. That, that That's ultimately going to be the main value uh, of the list. Uh, and so now that I've got you here locked in the booth, um, you guys have I'm, what I am sure is a much stricter methodology uh, to, to – to, and you, this is a permanent list you maintain – uh, I don't remember. Do you? Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but can you name the organizations? Yeah. Well, so there's how two, many of them are there? Uh, so there's four top charities that give well recognized right now. Yeah, yeah. we are, the, the unfunded list has four organizations. What do you know? Can you name them all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can. Yes, I can name all four. <laughs> it's a challenge sometimes. So it's Girls Health Ed. It's organized. Uh, it's Accountability Lab, uh, and it's the the Lookout Festival, an art an arts festival. Um, actually, that uh, was proposed by our, our our host today, the the um, the Lookout DC. Um, and that was, uh, I didn't pick, I didn't pick the list. I, uh, I have a matrix I gave to all of the evaluators and just in sort of in generally, well, I did ultimately choose the list, but I did it based on, uh, the four, these would by and large, the four organizations, the evaluation team liked the best. There was no, there just, there was a huge gap between four and five. Hmm. And so I, that I was like, well, they, here's the four they liked and yeah. the rest they like, but. There's, they were either a major problem or there was a couple of evaluators who really didn't like it or something like that. So we're giving them really useful stuff, feedback, uh, introductions. I think we're going to improve everybody who applied. Uh, but in terms of launching the list, uh, pick those four. Did you start knowing it was going to be four or you just looked at what the break thinking, was? I didn't know how many proposals I received. Yeah. I was thinking 10 because, you know, obviously lists of nice 10. Number. I was a Letterman fan. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, and, but I, I used to, I always said 10 or so, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, you know, four, I think four is on, it might've been too many, right? Um, it's a lot of, for, especially if you're putting up a list for donors to consider donating to, right. that's a lot of organization. That's right. four, especially like full proposals, like yeah. the, to sit down and read everything I put up right. would, would take a, a personal a long while. time, yeah. uh, which I'm sure is true, uh, yeah. to look through, to, to look through your stuff. Yeah. Um, so, um, what, what are the, what are the four on, it's malaria something? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, (laughs) GiveWell's four top charities right now. We actually just, I, it was, I think ours went up a week before Giving Tuesday. Um, but we always try and refresh the list at the end of the year because that's, you know, the vast bulk of our donations come in in December as is common for a lot of charities, but partially because we update once a year, our donors know to sort of wait and see what the new recommendations look like. And you do this once a year. Yeah, we do. Hmm. I mean, we will do a, a check-in. I mean, we, we talk to the charities year-round, and we do a sort of formal check-in, usually in March or so, to reflect, like, how much money they raised in December and if there's hmm. any big need for a reshuffle. Um, but we aim for a once-a-year top charities update. Um, and, like, that really get sort of organizes the work year for most of my colleagues at GiveWell. And the main purpose of that is... If you're you're making your December donations, yep. if I remember correctly, it's like ninety percent of all philanthropy happens in December. Not all philanthropy, but of our eighty five percent of donations made based on our recommendations. I should double check it. Maybe it's eighty, but like a really large proportion of our of our money given based on our recommendations is in December. But I mean, it, it, overall in America, it's large, but it's not. 90. It's, a, it's not. Oh. 
uh, a large percentage for because of you know the, uh, the end of the tax year holidays. I feel like the t- like people take advantage of the tax credit. I don't think anybody ever gives because the tax credit. Totally. That's when they they do their giving then because that's they got to do it by right. then in order to get the tax credit. Right. They're never like I wouldn't give if it weren't for this tax credit. Right. Um, but uh, I agree with that. It's really interesting how much the public policy commentators miss that, and even like I think philanthropists are part of the problem, right? Like when. Uh, when I joke about it all the time. I'm yeah, like, yeah. Oh, dude, where is the tax credit there? I mean, it's never why. I never gave a gift. For, I mean, right. if you if you want to, if you're a rich person, and you want to avoid paying taxes. There's, there's better like, ways. <laughs> there's a lot of ways. No, I, I, <laughs> there's I th- a lot of ways to do that. I think it's really surprising because I, I think that like, <laughs> look, tr- a lot of charities seem to think that it is about the tax deduction mm-hmm. because uh, when Congress thinks mm-hmm. about capping it, they show up to oppose it, um, and I, I find that kind of disappointing, right? Like it, it, it it's a pretty regressive subsidy mm-hmm. for a lot of giving, and it's not. I mean, this is my personal view. I'm mm-hmm. not speaking for anybody, but uh, it doesn't seem like the. Is this something they would frown upon on giving? No, I don't think I don't think my bosses would mind. <laughs> but you know, this this is no, a, I agree. A lot um, of, a lot of wealthy folks uh, benefit a lot from the d- deduction. Mm-hmm. No, it, it, it is true, and uh, uh, poor folks donate. Uh, just as much uh, uh, in terms of total amount. Yep. Uh, but rarely do they get to take yeah. advantage of that deduction because most of them... Um, they don't itemize. Yeah, and overwhelmingly much. don't. Yeah. Uh, and they should... They, you, if you're, you should get the same benefit for... Yeah. For, My undergraduate advisor, Rob Reich, has written great stuff about this. And I think, like, he... I've heard of him. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's actually a different <laughs> Rob Reich. I should have gotten it. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> the one you've heard of is the former labor secretary. I can assure you that none of my Dickinson professors have you ever heard of. <laughs> they were all very smart. No, no, no. They went to good schools. My, 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 <laughs> mine was, um, he's a philosopher. He's a political scientist oh, uh, cool. who writes about philanthropy. And one of his arguments is that instead of having, like, a tax deduction for charity where, like, people in higher marginal tax brackets get more of a benefit fit for giving you should just have like some sort of like charity voucher or something um where like you give everybody every citizen some kind of voucher for their annual charity oh. um instead of like publicly subsidizing huh. and I, rob if you if you ever listen to this hopefully i didn't misportray your view i'm happy to take responsibility for that but that seems That's to me to be a, a better idea. way to subsidize charity. You get it as like a reward for filing your taxes sure here's your charity voucher. or it could be like when you vote right like the idea the basic idea or, is just oh, that oh, they encourage people and people show up to vote yeah the basic yeah, idea is that it's happen. like it's like a citizen <laughs> dividend instead of i right love now, it right now our charity system is really like uh the rich give a lot more and they're but also get a lot more of the tax benefits mm-hmm. and and therefore have a lot more of a say if you gave people sort of an equal benefit or an equal dividend to spend you know you can imagine like different forms of cultural production or or charity mm-hmm. becoming a much bigger deal and like you mm-hmm. said i think we'd still see a lot of people actually writing real checks because mm-hmm. like they give for the interest of well, i think you know some of the, the some of the most widely criticized philanthropy is these large gifts that go to higher education or the arts right and those are not gifts that everyday america these are only gifts that right. like the one that not just what well, you know the one percenters <laughs> make the one percent of the one percent yeah. make you know, we're talking about these $100 million, $200, $300 million gifts. Uh, there was an article in the New York Times a little while ago about um, the arts organizations in New York City raised $3.5 billion last mm-hmm. year. Uh, and, like, and I don't – arts get crapped on in philanthropy, yeah. and they should not. The arts are important. Um, we probably don't need – Three and a half billion. That was just in like they had like a list of the gifts that that, that did not yeah. count the like individual small gift stuff. That was just all the major donations yeah. from one year. Yeah, uh, and those gifts. I know why those gifts are made. I mean, they're they're made for access. They're made uh, I mean, because someone wants to to have name. art. Well, sometimes there are donors who will donate to a museum so that they can have first choice of the art for their own home. Oh wow, really? Yeah, we the there was there's a donor. His name is Mitchell Rails. I don't normally like to name names, but I don't like this guy very much. <laughs> he's like the hundredth richest person in America. He run, he's the founder of a company called Danaher. And there was a city paper expose a hmm. while back about him and about his arts philanthropy. Yeah, and he operates hmm. his own private museum out in Potomac, and he is a major supporter of every single art museum in D.C. and he. And the the reason for that is so that he can he's borrowing it right it's on loan from yeah, the yeah, whatever yeah. right it's but the, he's writing huge you know seven figure checks right. so when he asks to borrow the Picasso they let him borrow the Picasso right and like he's making the museums possible with yeah. his with his generosity but he's also right. it's also it's you know it's not particularly accountable or you know if 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 an everyday citizen right. has a problem with that there's 
Right. Yeah. Well, private There's museums... a special office where he can go to yeah. complain. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> I mean, private museums themselves, this is another point that's due to Rob. He gave a talk about this recently that I saw. Um, private museums themselves have a pretty weird status, right? Like if you're a wealthy person who has a big art collection and you and you put it in a separate building on your property, suddenly like you can make that a private museum. It's basically only accountable to you. You get the tax write off at that point that's for fine. all the donations. That's exactly what he did. And, and it, it, like you that's never part, have to it's really in, it's, to the public. It's yeah. funny. You haven't read the, you, I don't think you've read this art. It was a yeah. while back. He was yeah. a big donor to a program I was working for at the time. Uh-huh. Um, and this came out front page. City yeah. paper is yeah. uh, you might it, have it out yeah, there. Yeah. In terms, it's a, it's I know paper. Washington City paper. I don't. Yeah, yeah. I don't think we have it. Yeah, it's some, this an independent paper that often does like um, sort of take down yeah. type stuff. <laughs> it's not um, like it's like one of the alternative weeklies, right? Well, people need to be yeah. Well, yeah. people need yeah an alternative weekly. People yeah. need to be taken down every now yeah. and then. It's a you know it shouldn't be done you know willy nilly. But right, how else are we going to find out about the like? Because otherwise, the only way you, you learn about this guy's philanthropy is you see his name in the donor wall and yeah. you go, oh, how generous. Right. right. And that's how people are talking to him all the time. Oh, right. how generous. Like, well, you're keeping the best art for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Not so generous, maybe. Yeah. And he, you know, it was a, a, you know, he basically made, built a museum for himself. Yeah. And he gives, he picks like a, one school to like give it, like they can come one day a week and have a tour. Yeah. And as a result of that, it's a pub, it's public, open to the public right. museum because he does. Yep. Right. And one, you know. He, he's, I'm sure he's not there for the tour, right? right. He hires somebody to give a tour to some, right, right. and I'm sure the, I'm sure he gets thanked. Yeah. Or he gets some thirty thank you letters from a bunch of students, and and, and you know, and that's fine. He is making art available to a lot of people. Yeah. He, like, it's not nece- This is just the way the system is. Yeah. There's, um, you know, little ways I think it can be improved with some more accountability. Some, I love the the voucher idea. I want to look uh, a little bit more into that. Uh, I have not. You've not yet. Um, li- just list, delaying. I, what if I forgot them? Yeah, no, no, this is your. I clearly you're buying time because um, you don't because you can't name them all. That's not true. I can name them all. <laughs> um, so, and I'm just I'm just I've been trying to get you to drink more wine to make it more likely that you will listen. remember. <laughs> uh, more likely that I'll list, forget. Uh, you can you can clearly do it. I remember they did have complicated names. They do. They, yeah. So, let's see if I can round. Without them. further ado, um, the the organization that's number one and where we recommend that most individuals who use our research give is the Against Malaria Foundation. Mm-hmm. Um, they distribute insecticide treated nets to prevent the spread of malaria in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we think they're remarkably cost effective. Um, there's been a global net gap for like basically as long as there have been insecticide treated nets, but I actually mm-hmm. think it's not going to be around forever. And so donors have a pretty rare opportunity to continue to deliver these nets until the global community acts to fill this this gap. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I see that as a really promising opportunity. That's where I gave the bulk of my personal donation this year. Oh. Um, the other three top charities are uh, Give Directly, which is an organization that gives unconditional cash transfers to people living mm-hmm. on less than a dollar a day in Sub-Saharan yeah. Africa, particularly Kenya and Uganda right now, but I think they're expanding. That's awesome. Um, That's very effective. It's a, it's a really neat model because they, they take advantage of these mobile money systems that are – it's like you know people in Kenya had something that's better than Venmo like 10 years ago, which I think is kind of awesome. Um, well, are they because they're like a remittance-based economy? It, it, they are, but it, it actually came up as a domestic service. Like the, the I'm local – not an African no, 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 sorry. economist yeah, yeah. or anything, but <laughs> – so no, it's a, it's a they surprising had a greater case. need for something like yeah, that. Yeah, you. Would th- I, I don't know. Like Kenya had it, and other p- places didn't. So you need a particular story. It seems like the the telecom company in Kenya um, had mm-hmm. a, like a real innovation, basically, and and then they had regulatory, they had rules that allowed it to scale more easily than other countries. Um, so it's a sort of weird particular story, actually. But anyway, they ended up with a great mobile money system that allows you to really cheaply transfer money. To really low income people. And so Give Directly transfers something like 90 cents of every dollar donated to people living on less than a dollar a day, which I think is a really remarkable feat um, and and something. Compared to Western Union or something like that. that Exactly. So it's not like a competitor in the remittance market in that like you don't designate your your beneficiary. It's not not meant for you as like a, you know, a recent immigrant to send money home to your family. Um, But you actually, a lot of people do use M-Pesa and some of the underlying technology for that. Um, give directly is you know an aid aid, aid organization. They give. Not, I did not get the bug. It's back. You're you're, you're no Obama, <laughs> like I said. Um, if only we all could be. Uh, no, and that is, but that is the only difference between the president and I. He has better, reflexes. slightly faster hands. He has. Um, <laughs> anyway, so give. I I think give directly is awesome, and I think they're a sort of r- remarkably well run organization, uh, just really operationally efficient. Um, and so th- they're really fun to work with. And then the other two organizations are the Deworm the World Initiative, which is. Uh, a project of Evidence Action, a nonprofit that sort of spun out of 
Innovations for Poverty Action, which is one of the groups that sort of does randomized control trials on different things in low-income countries to try and figure out what works. Um, and the fourth one is the Schistosomiasis Control Initiative, which is probably... What the, was that first word? Schistosomiasis. Schisto. Schisto. Schistosomiasis. Exactly. Um, and they that's an intestinal parasite. Um, I think everybody... I think- I know Everybody knows that. Yeah, why would I explain that, right? Um, and it's super easy to treat. The pills cost <laughs> like 50 cents, um, sometimes much less than that, actually, because um, they're sometimes donated by the drug companies. Um, and that that's, both that and Deworm the World do sort of similar things. Deworm the World has historically worked more in Southeast Asia. It's just a control initiative has worked more in Sub-Saharan Africa. And they do like sort of country-level deworming programs. Um, to ensure that kids who have these intestinal parasites, which are super, super common, like a billion people have them, um, get the pills that kill them for, like, almost no money. Hmm. Awesome. So those were the so four. The, I, I remembered. Yeah, good job. The uh, So it was a, what, uh, the End Malaria Foundation. Against Malaria Foundation. Against Malaria Foundation. Give well. Uh, to give directly. Thanks. A lot of people get those confused, actually. The Schistosomiasis Control program. Initiative. Yep. Uh, and at the end, the and the worm deworm the world. deworm the world. I, could, I felt at that time. Oh. I definitely didn't get it. <laughs> this would be so much it better slipped, with video. Slipped right through. You my guys fingers. could just see Dave like oh, just, just grasping just after bug. I'm just basically just flailing wildly in here trying to kill this bug. And you're doing a really great job keeping your. I composure. missed it too. Yeah, you do need to. I feel like two hands is the right approach, but I'm drinking wine with my left hand. I have a little table here that helps me out. <laughs> uh, the, so. Uh, there's a few. Uh, what's interesting to me is there's three health organizations, uh, but then uh, just sort of a, like a more of a microfinance yeah. type situation. So uh, how is it? Uh, I imagine you have very complex methodology. Um, probably far. And we have a, and we do here uh, at the Unfunded List, Girls Health Ed organize uh, the Lookout Festival and Accountability Lab. See how much faster I can name our four. <laughs> uh, if I talked about them, then it would probably take the rest of the the rest of the podcast. Um, but um, you know, we have a we have a, a, a pretty complicated matrix. that's sort of about uh, it's because the, we're we're dealing with unfunded ideas. Uh, we're sort of uh, our focus is on does this idea already exist? Who you sh- who should you be looking for uh, to partner with? Is this innovation an effective one worthy of new funding? Like the, the you know those yep. sorts of questions. Uh, whereas you're sort of yeah. You're you grappling with uh, currently ex- already existing solutions to, to huge problems. You've chosen three very clearly health-specific problems and yep. then uh, a, sort of an economic fix yep. uh, in there. That's that. Uh, I mean, it's interesting to me. What What is it uh, about your methodology that... Um, that drives that outcome, yeah. <clears throat> well, so one thing is that a lot of our process for actually finding these organizations starts with the academic research base. So... The Give All Top Charities, we're trying to offer donors something that's really evidence-backed. And so when you think about what that, where you should look for that kind of program, I don't think starting with charities themselves is the best place to start because charities aren't social scientists. They're not the ones who are responsible for creating the evidence base for some intervention. Mm-hmm. And so we typically are actually starting with like the medical literature or the like economic development literature to look at where what are the mm. interventions or what are the programs that have strong evidence bases. And then we go look. That's very valuable because what philanthropist has time to do that? Right. And it's not something that like any even individual... a foundation with a staff. No, rarely it's rarely, rarely something that other folks would undertake. And you know, obviously, we benefit from people who have done similar projects in the past, right? So, mm-hmm. the WHO has done similar sort of prioritizing exercises. There's a, a report called the Disease Control Priorities yeah. Report that has various flaws, but it's pretty useful in some other ways. Um, so, anyway, there's there's we all have flaws. We we didn't we didn't create this from the ground up, right? Like we we <laughs> we exist in an ecosystem of people who are doing stuff that makes this possible. Um, yeah, 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 but yeah. the a big part of the idea is that we we don't ask charities to create the evidence themselves. We're looking for interventions that have strong academic evidence. And then we look for organizations that can show that they're delivering those programs really well. And so that's the case for all four of the organizations that we listed. That There's this really strong academic case um, that doesn't come from the charity itself. Mm-hmm. And the charity has really strong evidence that they're like delivering it well, but not necessarily strong evidence that the intervention itself works. So like AMF has surveys showing that people are hanging their nets and sleeping under them, but AMF isn't collecting the data to show that, you know, bed nets prevent child mortality. That's a bigger enterprise that, you know, academics have done a bunch of over the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, awesome. <coughs> Very good. And uh, do you have any, uh, any sense of uh, how much um, funding you've been able to generate by 
yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. producing these lists? I wish I remembered the exact number off the top of my head, but so last year I think we moved just under $30 million to the top charities. Um, wow. And then I think wow. this year, like, I mean, this is not official, and I don't think we're going to break it, but I, th I think we're looking at close to 100. Um, so you said $100 million was donated through your... Yeah, so it's not... It's, I don't... don't, don't but, but that's the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And honestly, even if it's half of that, yeah. then, like... Uh, yeah, and a, uh, a big... An enthusiastic round of applause right. for you. That's Thanks. incredible. Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that like, has been <laughs> kind of surprising is that, the like, you know, we just started, like, putting this stuff up on a, like, on a blog, on a, on a website a few mm -hmm. years ago. Um, and what we found is that there actually was a community of people who really wanted this. Mm -hmm. And so you know, we're not great marketers. We haven't done a ton of marketing. But what we found is that there's actually a lot of people who really did want this research. And once it existed, we're really excited to, like, take advantage of it and, frankly, to give a lot more. Um, mm -hmm. And so there, there's, like, a pretty large community of people who are giving, like, a, a significant portion of their annual income to our top charities because they feel like they can give with confidence now in a way that they couldn't before. In fact, they have a... A really talented staff of philanthropic advisors. That's right. That that's paid for, for by the, the community. Exactly. And right. so, we, you know, we're not consultants, but like we, a lot, it turns out there's a decent number of people who are sort of aligned around these goals. And so that, that's pretty attractive. I know some people who are philanthropic consultants who probably don't like what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> like the idea that we're, that we're undercutting them. Um, no, uh, I mean that's not a job that should exist. This should just the I, I feel as though, as you might imagine, this is information that should be available. I think that's true. Although, like as as a matter of fact, I think one of the things that's interesting is that like a lot of philanthropic consultants, a big chunk of what they spend their time on, right, is helping people reflect on their values um, and understand what are they trying to achieve in the world. And that is you're, yes, that and is so what they end very, up doing. Like, professional and that is a very thing. value. Uh, but that's not like. You don't, you didn't, and, and, and that's absolutely right. And I've had, this is a job I've done a couple times yeah. for a couple different folks. Uh, and you and you spend the vast majority of your time just sort of like as a, it's more like, like a life coaching yep. thing, right? Uh, and you end up like actually spending very little time talking about philanthropy. Uh, but that, I mean, uh, that's, <laughs> that's a, you know, that's how it works on a one-to-one -one level. Most people can't afford can't even afford to like think about living in a world where they could hire a philanthropic consultant or yeah. any consultant. Yeah. <laughs> Let alone one that's gonna like you're gonna pay this person to right. help you give money away. Yep. Uh, that's to most to the average person. Kind of crazy. A, a lo like ludicrous on several several different shades of ludicrous. But uh, as you you know mentioned earlier, and you're absolutely right, giving money away effectively very difficult. It's a full time job. Yep. Um, especially, and like, even if you're doing it as a full-time job and you're the world's biggest expert, you still have improvements you can make. Cause we're talking about solving the world's biggest, most yeah. intractable problems, malaria, right? Yeah. Poverty in Africa, right? Stuff that has been around for a long time. Yeah. If it were easy to fix these things, it would have been fixed. Mm -hmm. If simple charity could fix these things it would have been fixed. We've had charity for a long time. People yeah. have been tithing for a long time. International development's been around for a long time. Um, I don't know how need... this is. How, can I push back? Like, I, oh, I'm do you, so, can you do you disagree? Do you disagree um, with me? I, so, <laughs> if you disagree with me, by all means, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm not playing the devil's advocate. Um, I don't know. I mean, I certainly agree. This stuff is really hard. It's not easy fixes. We, it's not straightforward. We don't really know what causes poverty. Like, I think all of this is true. But I also think that the um, sometimes people make it seem more complicated than it is. Like, give directly is, I think, a really interesting example, right? Like, give directly gives poor people like. A ton of money up front and i don't know mm -hmm. like i don't we're literally still waiting on the research to show like does that like sort of bring people out of poverty in the long run or is it mostly just like it subsidizes consumption in the short run mm -hmm. but taking like the world's poorest people and giving them more consumption where they spend it on like food and health care and buying a roof so the, the roof doesn't leak mm -hmm. seems pretty awesome to me mm -hmm. um and so even though we're really far from like we're nowhere near a world where we're going to eradicate poverty this way, it would actually be surprisingly cheap to, like, eliminate the sort of, like, $1. twenty-five, $2 a day poverty in the world. And, it like, I think it's, like, largely just a failure of will to do so. Um, and, like, if, if sort of the global wealthy decided that they wanted to, it wouldn't be a hard thing to just, like, give the money and do it. Or, I mean, frankly, for, like, rich countries like the U.S. to commit you, to doing so. So what is it you think keeps them... So, and again, I don't... I, I agree. Uh, I agree with you. It's not um, uh, when I say if charity could solve it, you know, it would have. Um, I I um, I don't mean we need a necessary like uh, a very complicated mm -hmm. <laughs> solution. I do. You're you're right. The the just the the one percent could solve global poverty. Right. Uh, there's math. I'm sure someone's already written right. that article out there. Peter Singer um, wrote a version of it in 2006 yeah. in the New York Times. What is um, right? Uh, what is keeping? 
what's keeping them from doing that? Though? Yeah. I mean, I think there's sort of two things. One is that, like, p- people aren't as generous as they, like, would like themselves to believe they are. But they are donating enough money. They're donating some, but not a ton. I mean, so, I mean, you know, take like... What, take, um, the, take the worst... Take, just take every single donation of over $100 million to an Ivy League school this year, uh-huh. and we could we could make a, if not eliminate, yeah. a huge dent in global poverty. Yeah, I mean, they wouldn't eliminate it. I, I don't know... It'd be fun to do that exercise and see how far it goes. Uh, I could co- probably come up with something. Yeah, like, yeah If yeah. I counted symphonies, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, like totally. Symphonies, orchestras, ballets, and Ivy League schools. Yeah, yeah but I mean, only I, fifty plus million dollar gifts. I mean, I still think it's like sort of surprising. Like, even very wealthy people don't give as much as you might think. Like, it's sort of like once you're a billionaire, like, what do you expect to do with all the they money? Give a, a lower percentage than poor folks do. Um, so that also is a commonly stated not- stat that I don't think is true. Um. Because like poor folks, if you take the all of the, uh, I think once you get to income the, of the lower income bracket and the total amount of giving, yeah. and compare it, the, this like people write this article that doesn't every, necessarily make sense because it doesn't apply to the one percent. Income yeah. and rich people are not necessarily that. Yeah. That's not where their money comes from. Yes, yeah, it's, it's partially <laughs> the wealth thing. It's partially like the surveys that um, the surveys that people use to generate these kinds of statistics don't have good penetration of like the one percent. Um, so anyway, I wrote a blog post about this once, which is why I have a pet peeve about it. Um, but the it's really interesting. I think that like look, I'd like to read them. Uh, I'll, I'll send their philanthropy is fairly trackable, though. Uh, their philanthropy is trackable. You've got to be able to. No, but it, it's not that trackable. Like a lot of it is given anonymously, and their income is super untrackable. Right, the Forbes list is like made up. Tell me about. Uh, it. <laughs> um, so I mean, actually, a lot of people, as you might know, at universities or whatever, people have ask the job. me how much money the foundation has. I'm like, I have no idea. Wait, I really? Don't know. No, you have to file nine ninety. Hmm? I, I don't. <laughs> it's funny. They've been writing. Those your, are publicly the, the, available. The, the other guy at, uh, at uh, uh, so you're working a little bit for Dustin Moskowitz yeah. from Facebook. The other right. guy, uh, there's another guy at Facebook who recently uh, got some, like, inexplicably negative press mm-hmm. about what is ar- inarguably only a positive development, mm-hmm. right? He just chose a slightly different, yeah. and, like, any, what, what, I, what I like about it, they're like, well, he's, what he's doing is just a tax dodge. All foundations are tax done. <laughs> the only yeah. reason, you, if you want to write it, nothing's stopping you from writing checks. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I thought that the tax dodge thing was, like, particularly incoherent in his case. Cause, yeah, like, but I, we're not a, we are not, we are also not a 501c. Oh, system. interesting. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had, it. Well, there was one, uh, but I don't see any advantage. I don't see any advantage yeah, yeah. to that. No, yeah. For me, not for me. I, there's often not, right? And, like, being able to give politically or, or to be exempt from, like, the 5% payout I, I'm rule. not a, I'm not, yeah. I'm, so the 5%, like, I, it's more than 5% was what yeah. I'd be giving, but I don't see a reason to yep. have a weird requirement yep. like that. And the I'm, I like transparency, but I don't necessarily, like, need that. And the, and the only people who look up my 990 are fundraisers, yeah. right? And so yeah. I don't necessarily need to be having those conversations with people who already know the answers to the questions they're asking me. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. Um, well, well, what was really interesting was reading all that negative press about Zuckerberg for yeah. a setup that was basically the same thing I had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that must have been fun. I mean, I, I thought, like, yeah, it the, was. the Felix Salmon, like, I thought the Felix Salmon response to that was, like, sort of right on. Mm-hmm. I mean, the... Um, yeah, for the folks at home who may not have read... Um, basically, Salmon said, like, look, Zuckerberg made all his money, like, creating something new in the world and doing something innovative, and he's going to do something similar with his philanthropy. You know, I, I do think it's, like, good and appropriate that people are starting to question philanthropic commitments more, right? I don't think that the right response yeah. is just deference. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, and, yeah. And sometimes I see people... Oh, it shouldn't just be, oh, isn't he wonderful? Right, right. exactly. So, Wait for him to do something good. And yeah, then, exactly. And then call him and, wonderful. And so waiting, you know, pushing back and engaging critically, I think, is super valuable. We appreciate that when people do that for us um, mm-hmm. and I think yeah, look, it like, helps you grow and become better right exactly like philanthropy like doesn't get enough like thoughtful criticism and so you know there can be knee-jerk stuff but like getting people who really engage and think critically and so you know my guess I, I, I've i never met Mark Zuckerberg I don't know him at all but like I saw, you know, I had a bar I went, on eight, <laughs> 18th Street Lounge I met him once he bought a round for everybody and I thanked him well, well, quite generous of you good job um, <laughs> you know so I, I don't know exactly I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I just said the. I mean, the you were talking about criticism of. Um, oh yeah, of yeah. So it's, it's oh, I was going to say like I bet they appreciated the the Dale. Um, there's a book about their their funding in New York. Um, mm-hmm. that was like I think very thoughtful and somewhat critical, but like super nuanced. Um, and 
you know, my, my suspicion would be that like they were like, wow, we got a New Yorker writer to go like investigate and do a book that we can learn from. Yeah. Um, and, and I would hope that I think that as a philanthropist, like even it's annoying when the headlines are like sort of unidimensional or like this was a failure. But well, look, being able to you have an article about agree. how Mark Zuckerberg is a terrible philanthropist, mm-hmm. a lot more people are going to read it right. than Mark Zuckerberg started a foundation. Mm hmm. Um, and also, he didn't start a foundation, right? So that's the fun part. <laughs> uh, there, uh, so no, no one in America has ever been asked, uh, "Is it a real foundation?" More than I have, mm. uh, but soon uh, Zuckerberg may overtake me. Yeah, I mean, I think he's probably <laughs> he's and doing he'll be able to well say no, no, not a real yeah, foundation. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's what's a real foundation, right? Yeah, well, I mean, so it's, it's an a entity, legal entity that gives me, yeah. I have a legal entity that gives money away. No, I mean, and I who have cares? A, right, right, right. And I have a minor insurance <laughs> problem, right? Like. People ask, like, what is the Open Philanthropy Project? And I have a fun time trying to explain, like, well, it's a partnership. Yes, earlier in this episode, you had a... Yeah, right. <laughs> you had, you had I, a similar I said it at, time. like, 50% too fast for people to understand. So, listen, we could uh, probably uh, talk about philanthropy in this booth all day. We are running low on wine. Uh, and in a couple minutes, uh, this episode, will be, well, the file size will be, like, too big to upload to WordPress. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I'm going to call it to a close. I'm going to uh, invite you back for season three wine grants so just let me know when your next trip to dc is we'll have you have you back in the booth uh have another bottle of, maybe we'll get two bottles next time uh and i'll find some way to get around that uh file size requirement <laughs> great um, well it's fun to be here thanks a lot for having me yeah no this is a, this is a great conversation I, um and uh, i look forward to uh having more conversations with you um uh, and best of luck uh to to everything with give well uh, and with your eventual transition to the open philanthropy project which will maybe be a real foundation or a not or a fake exactly foundation. who knows It'll be a fun mystery <laughs> as always i want to thank our host the lookout dc which is a beautiful co-working community for filmmakers located in the adams morgan neighborhood of washington dc uh thank you everybody thank you alexander uh, and uh, everybody at home good luck with your funding.